Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking. As today I'm doing a little bit of experiment behind the scenes. I dropped my DLSR and it's kind of acting wonky, so I'm experimenting using a new camera, a new audio system, even a new computer system and software and stuff like that. And hopefully this will be my on the road rig uh, after I get a new DSLR and go back to my old setup. This is just going to be experiment. So y'all please tell me down in the description down below what your impression is of this setup. Now today's video, this woodworking tips and tricks video, is going to be a small discussion brought about upon the last uh, tips video I did, number 94, where I talked about how to price your work. Because some of the feedback I got out there is pricing your work is irrelevant unless you have a place to sell it. So today is going to be my experiences on all the various places I've sold in the plant past and more importantly, ways to discern which kinds of places are good for you and which you might want to find another. So welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and today we talk about where you can sell stuff. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different places you can market your wares, but all that's irrelevant if you don't know where I'm coming from, if you don't know what I sell. So here's a quick montage of the various booth setups for you to judge our products and compare it to how and what you want to sell. Everything I merchandise is something a person can walk away with at an art market or a farmer's market, or I can ship easily. Well, I do know some people that sell things like tables at shows, expecting peer people to carry them away. That's been the exception in my opinion. So understand, my excuse is skewed to what I sell. So I want to start this out by making it very clear that I am not an expert in this field. Uh, I'm not the worst at it. I'm not the best at it. I consider myself pretty average. Uh, my history here is I used to work art markets, farmers markets, mainly as a marketing thing for a school I was running and to supplement my income because I wasn't making money for the school. Uh, and at that point in time, I was probably working one to two markets uh, every week. Then when the school shut down, it became my main source of income so I could subsidize working on YouTube. And I was working over 100 markets a week. That sounds extreme, but most weeks uh, from you know January through about September, I would work one or two markets a week, mostly Saturdays and Sundays. And then starting in September, I would be hitting three or four markets a week. I might do an art walk on Thursday night or Wednesday night in one of the cities around the area. I might do a farmer's market Friday afternoon. I might do an art market or a craft market Saturday and Sunday. It may or may not be the same market because I do know some markets that are Sunday only and some that are, are only Saturday only. So those last three months out of the year, it was just go, go, go. And my production work was basically trying to replace the stuff I sold. But the prior nine months, I was building up inventory as best I could. So that's kind of my history right there and making it clear I was not the best out there. But as a kind of a point in reference, let me talk to you about the best I ever met at this game. Okay, He started about a year before COVID hit. Now, I haven't worked a market since the COVID lockdown. I don't plan on working on another market until probably about September, which means I'm taking basically a year and three quarters off from working any kind of market, mainly because of COVID. Some markets have started back up. I'm just staying away because I got to build up inventory and stuff like that. So it's not going, it's not feasible right now. But this gentleman started about a year before COVID tent and he came to one of the farmer's markets I worked and he just kind of repeatedly went back to that same market where I typically worked that market once a month. He sold birdhouses, okay? He, his tool, tools that he used to make that was he had a miter saw. He did have a table saw, but he told me he didn't use it because he's kind of scared of it. He had a jigsaw, he had a drill, and he had a bunch of different size drill uh, bits and a lot of hole bits uh, to drill the hole for the birds. You know, he had the drills, he had a nail gun, he had a glue gun, 
and he had a blowtorch. And this gentleman was retired. Uh, he basically took care of his grandkids. He would take them to school in the morning, pick them up in the evening, and babysit them until his parent, their parents came in. And he liked to go on family events on the weekends. So that was his whole life, and he was looking for something to pay his personal bills. So he started this little craft woodworking business selling birdhouses. Now, because we were both woodworkers, they set us next to each other quite a bit. Uh, we didn't sell the same thing, so it was kind of there. And I got a lot of times to talk to him. And basically, his work week started on a Wednesday. After he dropped the kids off, he would go by one of the big box stores, and he would buy cedar fence boards, not the post, not the cross beams, just those boards out there. That was his main building material. And he would go by one or two Goodwills and he would basically clear them out of silverware or little mixing cups or anything like that that he could get cheap and modified. On Thursday, he would build between 35 and 50 birdhouses of all the same design. And he would do that every single week. On Friday, he would decorate them, starting by burning them. He wouldn't blacken the entire thing. He would just kind of singe them in kind of artistic spots to make them look weathered and stuff like that. He would go pick moss off of the oak trees and using hot glue, staples and stuff like that, he would attach it around there to make it look like they had grown that way. Then he would take the silverwares and he would make little scenes or something like that. Maybe put a little wire fence around a little uh, steel mixing cup and have a little pool right there. He'd use spoons as a little landing perch for the birds. You know, you could decorate. He just did lots of different creative stuff out there, but those 35 to 50 were all pretty similar, okay? Then on Saturday, he would take half of those, 15 to 20 of them, as his new designs for that weekend, and then he would click three to four of other designs he had done on earlier weekends. So he had a good selection with one main one that was his new model that week. And he would get some, a lot of people would buy one every week or something like that. And they just put them on their fences and as kind of a backyard decoration. Now, I've kind of explained how many he bought out, brought out to the market. And this gentleman would routinely sell out before noon. The, that farmer market started at 9 and went to 1. So you got there a little bit before 9 and it took you a little while to set, uh, break down. Now, I will admit that this gentleman was a great salesman a lot. Everybody liked him. He was fun to talk to and stuff like that. But you look at his margins, how much labor he put into him, stuff like that. He admitted it was a casual three to four half days a week. And he liked the fact that by two o'clock he was back home with his grandkids on a Saturday. Now, I want you to keep that story in mind as I talk about stuff and explain my tips and techniques and stuff like that because he break, broke, he's an example of somebody that breaks every single guideline that I've worked over the years to come up with for myself, and he's the best I've ever seen. So I wanna first talk about online marketplaces. I'll describe them, I'll tell the kind of people I think do well, and I'll try to give you some tips and techniques to help success, you be successful if you're going down that route. Now, the first kind of markets I kind of think of are your local markets where you're using the online presences to market to your local audience. And that would be like Facebook and Craigslist in my mind, somewhat of a modern day classified. Now you think about, and they're widely regarded as a great place for a lot of people to start out. You see a lot of YouTubers out there that extol the virtues of those mediums. I have found that the people that go to those markets, uh, that those venues to find products to buy, they pretty much know what they want and they're looking for a selection. For example, if somebody wants a backyard picnic table, you know, they'll be searching for Facebook marketplace for backyard picnic table, or maybe they're just searching for backyard furniture and they find picnic tables and stuff like that. It's more of a craft style stuff. You're not gonna, I don't believe you're gonna find high art kind of stuff being sold off of Craigslist for a lot of money. Uh, this is an entry level area for people with entry level skills a lot of times. Now, if you're doing this, um, 
it's going to be very price sensitive because the people that are looking at that one well, you shopped. I mean, last time you looked at Amazon for something, uh, something specific. What did you do? You looked at the picture, you looked at the price. Picture price, picture price. You scrolled around until you saw something that looked good or looked like the design you want. If the price was okay, at that point in time, you do the research. So if you're doing this kind of marketing, you can make subpar work but if you have really good photography skills, really good setup skills, you can take a great marketing picture of your product and you're somewhat price competitive, you'll probably do pretty well. Uh, if you are kind of like me and you saw the products I sold, uh, what am I going to advertise on Facebook Marketplace? wooden bowl, pecan bowl, handmade bowl, that kind of stuff, that really doesn't give me a lot of opportunity to upsell that product, to build value in the product, to get it to the price where I return a good investment, no matter how good I take a picture. The other kind of online classified would be stuff like Etsy and eBay, and that's more of a national one. I'm not dealing with international stuff because I stopped shipping internationally a long time ago. But once again, it is price, picture, price, picture, price, picture. That's, that's where they're scrolling to find what they're looking for, to find both a design and look that they think they want and something that's in their price, what the budget they have. Which between looking at picture and looking at price, there's nothing in between for, uh, for, their, for you to be given a chance to justify a higher cost. So it's really, really competitive. The other one is you can actually do online retailers. I'm talking like places like Amazon. And I do know some craft woodworkers that do really well like that. They might make uh, toys, wooden toys, or something generic that they can mass produce really quickly without a lot of inventory, box up creatively, inexpensively in individuals, and then send an entire box of one item to Amazon to put into their inventory, and then Amazon takes it from there. Granted, you're not you're not going to make as much money per piece, but there's efficiency in scales, even in a small shop. But once again, it comes down to brilliant picture taking, competitive price. I'm I think you can tell I'm not a fan of any of those. But there's the fourth area your own website and it can be really good for you given a brand and what i mean by that is i i could be the most the best woodworker out there making the greatest product out there but if i don't have a name brand that people are wanting to come to visit I'm not going to have the traffic at my website. I'm not going to have people coming in and even giving me a chance to look at my products. Now, Nick Offerman, a famous comedian, a well-known woodworker, people know that name. So he can attract people to his website to sell simple coasters, simple meat boards or cutting boards, that kind of stuff. High quality items for sure, but not the most highly skilled skilled things to make and he gets and his team makes a good profit but all that is because of his name now me personally i've been selling online for a very long time but it wasn't until i hit about a hundred thousand subscribers on youtube that i started getting purchases online on a regular basis and by regular i mean maybe two a month that's how scarce it was but all of a sudden, once I hit, you know, 100,000, some of the woodworking I had in my videos, I could use that audience and sell, sell via there. Hey, if you, you, saw, if you like this one, it's, I'm going to have it on my online store. It's very soft sell that way. But those, you know, 4,000, 10,000, 20,000 people that watched your view, that is a big watch your video. That is a bigger audience than you will find at a farmer's market. And you only have to have one of those interested in buying it. So it was the fact that I had a avenue to market the worth effort brand, so to speak, 
that got me the initial interest in the product so that they came to my personal website. Now, once you get them to your personal website, you have more than picture price. All of a sudden, somebody that's actually taking that effort to come to your website, they're gonna read this in uh, the, the description so it, you have the opportunity to add value to your product. So not only do you have to have the brilliant photography, you don't have to be as price competitive because they can't go anywhere else to get a Sean Graham bowl, but you have to justify the price you're asking by what you're providing them. And a lot of that is the information on the product, the history, the techniques to build it, that kind of stuff. Of the stuff I've talked about online, the personal website is the only one I've ever had any iota of success, but that was more because I had a means of marketing via my online presence. Now, if you aren't that comfortable merchandising yourself face-to-face -to, -face to individual, the next option might be your best, and that is forming a relationship with a true brick-and-mortar store. A lot of times these are just uh, one-off furniture stores in your area, uh, owned by a, you know, a couple or an individual or something like that. You're not really going to get into the chains with the kind of products you make out of your garage because they're, they can do better importing a hundred of the same kind of bowl for all the chain stores around their country. Now, if you're going into a brick and mortar store, you have to understand that they have a lot higher overhead than you do. So they have high rents, utilities, marketing, all that kind of stuff. So you're not gonna get as much for your product as you would selling yourself. That's just common sense. And traditionally the markup is plus or minus 50%. So when you're pricing your work, you can charge a little bit less because you're not having to do all that marketing, the selling, you're not having to travel to events and stuff like that. You can just stay in your shop and make, 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 and charge less than say I, who are having to do that, uh, do that kind of work to the realtors. But understand, they're gonna sit there and double that price. And if that doubled price is way past what that thing is worth, you're never gonna sell anything. So a lot of times you end up skimming by, by the skin of your teeth when you're doing it that way just because you have to lower your price so that they can make money and keep the price within reason. Now, I used to be in a lot of stores. And when you're first starting out, these stores are not going to buy your inventory. They're want, going to want you to do it on consignment because you have no history with them. Once you've been selling with a store for a few years, you might be able to talk them into, you know, maybe a net 30, next 60, 90, where they pay for your products within 90 days, 60, 30, that kind of stuff, or even talk them into paying for it up front. But that's after a lot of relationship development. Up until that point, you're out the money until they sell it. And then maybe 30 days after they sell it, you will get your money because it just takes time for them to bookkeepers, all that. There's always an excuse. So it just gets extended quite a bit. So you might set up a brand new store with, you know, a hundred different items. Don't expect your first check for three until for three or four months. It just works out that way. I developed a very bad taste for doing that kind of business because A, the time delay, B, inventory control. Once a month, I had to go to every single store to resupply them and count what they sold. So you know, you have your list of all your items, you're going through, you're checking out, you find nine out of 10 items and you ask them, okay, it looks like you sold number 10. And they either say, yeah, we did, or a lot of times, oh, no, we didn't. Let's go look for it. So you spend 20 minutes going through the store, finding it. You find it. It's in a display in the cor corner where a customer will never find it. It's just supplementing something they actually want to sell. Or you never find it. But because it isn't in their sales records, they say they didn't sell it. So they just kind of walk away. And you know, nine out of 10, that one out of 10, that's about what I was averaging. 
And a lot of times it was just little stuff and you don't know, you just don't know. But what are you gonna say, okay? It's missing. You didn't sell it, you say, so, but you still gotta pay me for it. it, it it's a relationship nightmare. I never figured out how to deal with that. And I ended up pulling out of all stores I was consigning on. If they purchase it up front, they lose it, oh well. The other thing about consigning is they have no motivation to sell. More than likely, the stuff I make, you saw it, it ends up augmenting the stuff they really want to sell. They're trying to market a nice, big $3,000 table. They put a very large bowl on it. They put stuff in the inside of other things they do. They sell the table. They will never once say, hey, we, this bowl looks perfect with this table. You liked it when you did it. Would you like to buy the bowl at the same way? Additionally, the sales staff there have no information on how to upsell the value of what you're doing which is why for every single bowl I delivered to them or any other kind of woodworking, I always gave them a three by five card on each one of them and I labeled out all the added benefits. This is a pecan bowl. It came from so-and-so street in our hometown. It grew for over 200 years, which, yeah, that's, it grew for 80 years. Uh, it was uh, turned and dried and then returned over a period of two years to make sure it's cons it stayed consistent and it wouldn't crack over time. The finish is originally done with the shellac to eliminate any blotching effect over there. Then we coated it with an oil once a day for a week and then once a month for six months as it developed that full patina. Before delivering it, we put a heavy and highly polished coat of beeswax on it to give it some uh, water resistance. It is not going to be waterproof. You don't want to let it soak in the sink or put it through the dishwasher, but it will be perfect for salads, soups, seasoning, all that kind of stuff. And to take care of it, we recommend uh, natural walnut oil and occasionally a walnut beeswax mix if you want to bring the shine back. If you want to re-shine up the outside, a shoe shine polish would bring... I mean, you kind of give them the entire sales pitch. I did hear that a lot of times the salesman would just go, to go if they had a really customer, a customer, they would just give them the card and said, this came from the artist. But that was all, that's all there to build the value of what they would label as, oh, that's just a pecan ball. They have no motivation to sell it if it is there on consignment because they have no skin in the game. And frankly, I think that they would probably try to sell something that they did have this, their skin in the game on if you, they, did, they had to purchase some accessories. So I developed a bad taste for that kind of consignment situation. But I did have one store where the owners were very honest people. I trusted them. I, I was able to train them and I had good sales and eventually they came to the point where they, they were just buying stuff outright and we developed a great relationship. Uh, they did end up moving away so that store closed down but if you find those gems of people and the people is what going to be a recurring theme as we go forward, patronize them, take care of them, call them, they will be your best clients and they will alleviate a lot of the stress of selling stuff directly yourself if you don't like doing that. Finally, let's talk about direct sales. All the opportunities where you get to directly face the customer and there's no middleman. And this is kind of where I specialize because it's where you get the best return on your investment. And honestly, it's where you feel like your, your effort is rewarded the most because you get to see the people that are benefiting from it and their enjoyment. Uh, it can be a great enjoy, uh, great high if you had on a good sales day of that because you are valued for your work. Now, I will tell you, um, 
give you a quick little background. I paid my way through college mainly uh, on the 14 year uh, bachelor plan by going to night school and working days at a lot of motorcycle dealerships and a few car dealerships, mainly in sales and marketing. I know how to hard sell. I do not hard sell. I really do like the soft sell where a lot of times you're answering questions. A lot of times I will skew my answers of the questions to hot point, hot buttons that I pull out of a customer uh, through very light questioning. I'm not going to drag people into my customer thing booth and I'm not going to chase them out saying, well, if I discount it 10 bucks, will you buy it? Cause that just kind of diminishes everything in the booth. I give a fair price and I stick to it. I don't, very rarely do I negotiate. Dad does like to negotiate a little bit more than I do, but I will adjust my price from market to market and situation to situation. But once I state the price, I stick to it. But it's those one-on-one, this is the time that that one-on-one -on -one interaction is a skill you get to develop to maximize the price you get. It just takes a little practice. It's not that hard. It's just be friendly, be honest, and give a fair value for what you're providing. Part of what you're providing is the stories and the information in addition to the actual woodworking. And these next areas are the only times you ever get the chance to do that. So let's start at the high end. Art markets. An art market to me is generally uh, thrown by, you know, art guilds, local things like that. And the audience that comes to them is our actual buyers that are buying art for either themselves, a hotel chain, a new restaurant. A lot of times in this part of the country, we will have people from San Francisco, Miami, New York coming in not only to buy individual pieces, but maybe talk to artists to buy collections for that kind of stuff. This is pro craftspeople and artists uh, displaying their wares, a lot of times not to sell at the market, but to sell, make contact to sell in the future. Me, I'm trying to sell, the kind of stuff I sell there are stuff that people are gonna take away. But these are buyers. These are not a lot of looky-loos. As such, they are a higher quality of audience, of customers coming through that you have to. And these art markets, they charge you a higher booth fee for these. A lot of times these are two, three, four day events. You might be paying 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, 500, uh, to get into these markets. Now, one thing when people come into your booth, uh, these are not the markets I would do any barking and I'll explain that later. When they come in the booth, you have to kind of discern their education level a little bit. You don't want to talk above these people. You don't want to talk below them. You want to talk at their knowledge level. Uh, when you explain the added value that you're coming up to it. And if they ask you questions, you know, just answer those direct questions as best you can on how you build it. Because a lot of times they are trying to figure out how to sell the stuff themselves. Because if that's what they're there to buy a collection to take to their galleries. Now, I need to put out a warning. And this is going to be a warning you will hear me repeat at each venue. The people that are putting on this venue, you are their customer. Your customers are not their customers. They complete the sale when you buy a booth fee. They're not going to get any more money off of you after that purchase. So that's when the sale is done. They might give you an added service after the fact just to make you feel happy, but their job is done whether you make a killing or you goose egg, that's not their responsibility. Granted, they want you to earn enough money that you'll want to come back. But again, you bought the booth. There you go. So when you are judging these things before you go to them, because I always suggest you go look at them uh, before you pay the booth fee, show up early and pay attention to the type of vendors that are showing up. 
Now, you're not going to find people making, pulling up in huge, giant, brand new RVs, driving, driving, dragging Mercedes behind it, working as vendors. Most of the artists, you know, they might, at this level, they're probably middle class uh, income kind of people. But you look at, hey, are all the license plates from the same state you are, or are they coming from all over the country to attend this market? The people that are pulling in, are they efficient? I mean, when you look in the backs of their vans, if they're painters and stuff like that, a lot of times they'll have racks to stack stuff to protect it, and then they have a fold-down cot so that they can camp overnight to save money on motels and overhead expenses. I mean, you can kind of tell who's been doing it for a while and who hasn't, and if this, uh, the market it has a lot of people that have been doing it for quite a while, well, you know that they at least are generating enough of a return to want to come to that particular market over and over and over. And generally these markets are only once a year, maybe twice, but generally just once a year and they advertise all over the nation for them. That's the high end level. Just below that, I kind of classify craft markets. And once again, they're going to be handmade products from artisans and stuff like that, but it might be thrown by your local community, uh, maybe once a month or that kind of stuff. And you get a whole bunch of handmade items. This is where you're going to get a lot of jewelry people, people just starting out in the business, maybe a lot of painters, which, you know, you look at them, you can tell that they're kind of in the beginning of their production career or they're copying some other people's design. Well, you can just kind of tell. There's just a certain level of proficiency. They are not putting a thousand hours into one piece. They might be putting in 10. Now these events, a lot of times, are a lot more social. You're getting the local community. It's a monthly event, come hang out. Listen to music, let the kids run around, socialize. You walk your dog through the area. In my town, uh, San Marcos, we have Art Squared. It's a market that I helped start you know, nine, maybe 10 years ago. And when I say I helped that, it just means I regularly attended it at the beginning when there's maybe three or four of us that would show up pretty regularly. And a lot of times you had maybe six vendors. It started out in a little corner lot on the side of the university blacktop. It was miserable, but enough people showed up. We attacked, tracked enough of the audience. The city eventually allowed us to move on to the city, the courthouse square. And from there, it just grew and grew and grew. And nowadays you can get 50 to 100 vendors showing up uh, for this nice little community art market. But it's much more of a casual attitude. So as you're doing it, uh, you get, need to understand that a lot of people are this, there for entertainment. So you're kind of planting seeds for maybe the Christmas season when you're working through the summer markets and stuff like that. You're making sure that people know you, you will be back and you have products that will make great gifts if they're not there to buy that day. Now, the important things in these markets is, once again, very soft sell, nice, honest, night polite communication with them. If you can entertain them in any way, which every time I go to these markets, I bring either a lathe or an ax and knives or something like that. And I'm making stuff in front of people to draw people into my booth. The more I entertain them, the more they have a chance to look around or something like that. But while they're looking around, you need to make sure that you have a wide variety of items and a wide variety of price ranges. Have something for impulse buys. That would be sub $20 items. You know, they're just going to give you a $20 bill. You come, that's an impulse purchase in my area. When you start getting up to $25, all of a sudden people are thinking, well, what else could I do with this bill? It, it, it just seems to be the the thought barrier right there. So you wanna have a lot of stuff in the mid-range price range, and that's gift items, bowls, Christmas items, birthday gifts, wedding gifts, that kind of stuff. And a lot of times when they buy a gift, they'll also buy something for themselves. It just kind of works that way. So if you have stuff in that 25 to 100, $150 range, You'll do good, but you also want to have a few halo items, something that's really going to draw attention, that's going to show 
off all the skill you have displayed in there. And that will be a conversation piece, something that you could talk about to build value in there so that they know that when they're patronizing you, they're also patronizing somebody that's taking their craft well beyond the product that they're buying. And it's just, it's a nice added benefit. Key things is variety, different price levels. If you don't have a good sales day, it might be that you just didn't have enough variety for people to choose from and not that your prices were too high. Typically these type of markers, they range anywhere from free to maybe about 50 bucks per booth fee. And generally they're one day events. But maybe down a price level are gonna be farmer's markets. And I've always done really well in farmer's markets because of the products I sell. Bowls, containers, utensils, that kind of stuff, where they're just slightly ancillary of the fruits and vegetables and, and meat that people buy at farmer's markets. But you are gonna have a lot of more impulse purchases. So you wanna have impulse priced items at your booth. And once again, I like to entertain because you are going to have a lot more families coming out to those things. But just like the art markets, craft markets, I haven't feel, I, I've never really found that they have a lot of stuff in association with the market other than maybe a band. But farmer's markets, you know, you'll see them set up, uh, they'll drag out giant foam jungle gyms for the kids to come out there. They will have live bands all the time coming out. They might have petting zoos coming in. They might have musicians roaming the market. They might have hula hoopers doing that kind of stuff. And it looks like a great market because of all the activity going on and stuff like that. But understand that is marketing for you, the vendor, to come out to those kinds of stuff. They're trying to attract new vendors because once they get their 25 to $50 for the day, their market is done. And in fact, probably about half the markets I've attended, farmers markets I've attended, the people that run the place are generally leave an hour early and just let maybe a few employees pick up the leftover tents and stuff like that. So it kind of tells you their motivation. They're trying to get as many vendors there as possible. But again, I do very well. And I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of selective of what farmers markets I do. I might, I will go check them out. And once again, I will look for professionals at a market. You can kind of tell, you know, a farmer going to farmer's market, they're not going to be the wealthiest people. But, you know, if they set up efficiently, they have a nice, efficient uh, design, they're personal people, and you can tell they've been doing it for a very long time because farmer's markets tend to go back to the same profitable markets over and over again, key word being profitable. Well, you can kind of tell. If you're at a farmer's market that has a lot of, you know, college kids selling CBD stuff or whatever the latest trend is or scarving that you can tell is just made the week before, little wire jewelries, you see all kinds of things. If it's permeated with that kind of stuff or, you know, food vendors that are just kind of setting you up, selling tacos or baked goods that you can just kind of tell they're new to the game. I kind of leave those away until those markets settle down. Just personal uh, observations because I just have never done very well with the markets that are permeated by new vendors. After the vendors, you're gonna to wanna to judge the quality of your customer base, the people that are coming into the market. If you observe through the course of the day that the people that are coming in, they're going from the parking lot to their specific farmers and then booking it, that's not a customer for you. You can't count that as an opportunity. If you have you know, a family dragging their kids around in strollers with a dog, all that kind of stuff, just kind of picking up some casual vegetables and spending the afternoon there, they might in the future be an impulse buy or they might come back to you, but they're probably not gonna be an opportunity for you to sell right then and there, just my experience. You do have a lot of people that come to artists, uh, farmers markets uh, as a regular social event and that you have an opportunity there. And uh, that tends to be, I don't wanna classify as a hipster class, but they're kind of like that way.
I'm also observe the quality of the parking lot. I mean, the cars that are coming in, are these going to be customers that have discretionary income? Make your judgment. I mean, it's, it's stereotyping, but sometimes that kind of stuff works and it's your money that you're trying to earn. The other type of market are what I, I call flea markets down, or we call flea markets down here, or days. Uh, an example in Texas would be up in Conroe or in Wimberley, that kind of stuff. And those are the places where you have thousands of vendors show up. A lot of times these vendors will uh, buy a booth area for a year or five years and actually build a structure, even though they might only set up once a month. Uh, but you know, it's that kind of stuff. I call it kind of found art because you really don't find people that are making art from scratch or craft from scratch in these kind of situations. It's a lot of antiques. It's a lot of repurposed stuff. There, people are selling funnel cakes. It's got a carnival atmosphere. Rustic chic comes to mind a lot of times. Uh, I have worked a lot of these because you know you see the volume of people showing up. You, you just know it's got to be great. And I bomb there left and right. And the only reason I can think of is people are coming there to buy, but they don't expect to buy the type of stuff you're selling. There's a reason why they're all kind of that same found art genre, because that's what the audience wants in those venues. So for me, what I sell, I've just kind of, I've given up on that kind of stuff. There's better opportunities out there for me. But if you're making more the home, that style of merchandise, it might be worth a shot. But the key thing there is always going to be location. You want to be close to a main path because a lot of these things have interwaving stuff. And if you get on the wrong street, you're going to have no traffic forever and nobody's going to know you're there. And if this is the first time you are setting up, well, a lot of times that's where they're going to put you because, you know, that's the only open boost that, that are available. My suggestion is if you want to try that out, maybe talk to a vendor that's already set up there that might have a sparsely filled booth and kind of slip them a little money and say, can I have this little corner right here just to try it out? And if it works out for you, great. But that might go against the guidelines of some of these booth setups, but a lot of times under the table, it'll, it'll work out. And in kind of the same mindset that the customer base isn't there to see the kind of stuff I market, holiday markets. Now you would think because I sell a lot of holiday gifts that that would be great for me. But what I have found is the people that are coming out there are there for the entertainment. They're there to bring their kids to the manger petting zoo they're there to sing carols they're there to see the acts they're get there to get the funnel kegs they're there to see the lights and dragging your kids around for you know an hour or trying to find out where grandpa wandered off you don't want to be carrying bags of stuff you just purchased it just isn't the right mood for merchandising Though the vendors that seem to do well, a lot of times are associated with the local store. They'll bring their holiday gear out there and just kind of say, we're here when you're ready to buy. Just go off of Main Street, come up by then. They use it more as marketing for future sales. And those kinds of people seem to do okay, or they, they meet the goals that they're trying to meet. And finally, let's talk about being a street urchin. Working the sidewalks, get walking those corners, barking to the customers. Yet I'm painting the picture I want to paint there. Because believe it or not, I've had some of my best days setting up on sidewalks in non events. Well, I say non events, they're what they call art walks. And in our part of the country, you know, sometimes on a Thursday, a art group or something like that will arrange for all the local business to just stay open maybe an hour or two later. They'll have little wine tastings, little music playing around, and artists will set up into the different restaurants and stuff like that. And I will find those and I will set up on the street on a sidewalk 
on the main path where I'll be turning tops to entertain the kids and I will be a, bring out a small select item to meet those markets. And I generally work those for the holiday markets. So I set up on the street corner, I might have a couple stands right here. I'll bring out a hundred carved trees. I sell 30 to 40 trees, you know, price be anywhere between 35 to $65. Maybe somebody buys a nice bowl as a gift price and they'll pick one up for themselves at the same time. You know, you make a half dozen sales like that or, and all of a sudden you have, you know, a thousand to two thousand dollars in profit for four hours worth of work because basically those kind of uh, art walks, they'll start around five o'clock. So you get there at four, you set up, they're breaking, they're shutting down at nine. You stay a little bit later and by 10 o'clock you're packed up and out of there. Six hours, a couple grand on a Thursday night. And then you still have Friday, Saturday and Sunday to sell. That's somewhat a bonus opportunity in my mind. Granted, a lot of those street side uh, art walks I bomb at, but it's amazing how well you do because you're a little bit of an oddity, but the people that are going to those things are appreciate the work. And I've done such things in on Austin, on Congress Street, up the hill. Uh, my best uh, show ever in one of those things was uh, outside a bar in, in, uh, in Bastrop. Uh, I typically would try to break down around 9.30 of that one because that's when the drunk started to coming out of the bar and I didn't want to deal with that one. But, you know, there was money there. And those events are typically ones that you don't have any kind of booth fee. Though sometimes you might be asked to join the art guild or association or stuff like that, you know, 10, 15 bucks or something. Uh, but a lot of times it was nothing. And I would just make, if I found a good spot, I would make sure that I tipped the owner of the bar or the restaurant or the coffee shop I set up out of with a bowl or something like that. Roughly equivalent of 40 to $50, which I would have paid for it at, at a booth fee. Uh, and they'll invite you back month after month because you draw a a crowd to their business so they kind of benefit too and i'm successful at that those events because of the kind of audience that comes there it always comes down to the people and your interaction with it being polite to the customer base even if they might be slightly insulting to your work if you continue to be polite continue to educate them in a soft sell manner, a lot of times they'll still purchase it at the price you're asking and be firm on the prices if you feel you are fair. Well, I hope you got a little bit out of this ranting. Maybe some of y'all noticed that I ditched the mic halfway through. I will show you this. Uh, I, I have filmed this episode five different times because I had camera and audio issues. Everything seemed to be working different. But down in the comment, tell me what you think about the camera and the sound and stuff like that, the color balancing, all that kind of stuff as I explore a little bit of technology. And I hope you learned a little bit from my experience on the road selling this kind of stuff at the various markets. And when you go to these markets, I want you to remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun. I almost forgot the bonus. This time it's gonna be the Word Worker's Pocket Book from Lost Art Press. I will tell you, I bought this just kind of on impulse. I am shocked at how good this is as a reference book. There's so many minute facts on chemicals, geometry, the different species of wood, the different styles, even, you know, little blocks, brackets, stuff like that. So you can know the names, you can look at, the, I mean, this is a reference resource that I guarantee you buy, you are not gonna regret it. Go pick yourself up one.